Hi, if you're new to this channel and you're interested in coverage on the Chris Watts case by someone who's written quite a few books on the case and also the editor and, and uh, person behind the Crime Rocket blog, please subscribe to this channel. Please uh, like, leave a comment and quite important, please share across your social media, uh, whether it's Twitter or Facebook. And uh, let's get started on this episode. And apparently what they had done is they had flown a drone over top. They had spotted a bed sheet. Don't ask me how or where, whether it was something that was accidentally left behind, blew out of the back of his truck. I can't imagine he'd bury a woman in a shallow grave and leave a sheet peeking out. But they found a bed sheet somewhere around this site. But before they knew any of that, before they knew any of his confession, they were already taking a drone out to that site. Do you think it's because the GPS on that work truck, and by the way, the police call it a work truck, Shanann calls it a work truck in her videos, do you think it's because they ascertained from his tracking device on that work truck that he'd been at that site far longer than a normal work day would have had him there? Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Today we're going to look at points 17 to 44 in the October 2018 section of the chronological timeline. This section deals with the business end essentially of the Watts case. A lot of it was unseen, obviously it was going on behind closed doors. It was the um, machinations around the plea deal that that were going on that the public weren't aware of at the time. In fact, we were we the public were actually misled uh, until it was actually announced in court. We weren't the only ones who were misled. The media were also misled, and a lot of what showed the true motives and intentions of the district attorney, Weld County, um, the coroner, but, but also Chris Watts, was the battle over the, the autopsy reports. People couldn't understand why they were being withheld. The media were eventually going to take um, Weld County to, to, to trial, scheduled on December the 21st. So that, that was when that was going to be heard. and But no one could really understand what was really going on. And the the news um, coverage of the case kind of went silent, except really for Ashley Banfield. And what I played there at the beginning of the, this episode was Ashley Banfield talking about something that was quite sensitive for some people. Although what she was saying was, was um, sort of logical and um, good investigative reporting, it was pointing the finger at Anna Darker, just directing attention at this company, which a year later was involved in a multi-billion dollar merger, a, a major murder merger of um, a major oil company. And they, they couldn't have liked this, this publicity. They couldn't have liked the aerial footage over one of the um, well sites, one of their properties. And that's exactly what you saw. You, you heard the name Anadarko in that clip that I played. And you can, you can um, go to scroll down the blog post, what else do we know, to that particular clip. And you can see the, the, the ticker tape along the bottom of the screen referring to Anadarko, referring to Anadarko's position on Chris Watts that, that they'd uh, released him as an employee, that they were willing to cooperate, but also that they were referring all information to law enforcement. In other words, they, they didn't want any publicity for, for very good reasons. Think about the marriage between Anadarko and Occidental Petroleum as um, something almost like Chris Watts and Nicole Kessinger. Are you going to want to engage in a long-term commitment with someone if they are exposed as um, nefarious in some way? 
if the public is hating on a particular person. Think about it in a personal way. You are in love with someone. You want to, you know, um, shack up with somebody. And then the next thing, they are in the news, um, all their dirty dealings or... Anyway, there, there's sort of a tension focused on this person that, that you, you love and want to engage with. But now it's going to reflect on you. So you really don't want this negative publicity. And that's what this entire court case was uh, or pending court case would have been. And one thing that I look out for in a lot of the, the coverage, I mean, in the Lifetime movie as well, I was just uh, wondering, are you going to ever see the word Anadarko? Are you ever going to hear the word Anadarko? Are you going to see the logo? And you didn't. The same kind of applied for Lavelle and Thrive. They changed the names. That's the kind of level of not only scrutiny, but um, care that, that the media need to, to show because of... Um, vested interests. So truth and justice are not as simple or easy as they seem. There, there's kind of a tug of war and a lot of strings being pulled in the background about who wants what discussed in public. And you've, got to, you've certainly got to ponder the judiciousness of that. Is hiding things away or um, PR and protecting bottom lines is that is that justice is that truth is that showing justice to be done but to return to the comment that Ashley Banfield made and again bear in mind that within weeks of this episode uh, Ashley Banfield was off the air she was off HLN um, one could even argue that it happened days later and, and again one's got to ask why you know what prompted this? Why was it happening? And if we go back to the clip at the beginning, she talks about not or, or struggling to believe that, that a bed sheet was just left out in the open. I must say, I struggled to believe that as well. I thought, wow. In fact, the way that I imagined it was I thought um, Shanann had been buried, wrapped in the bed sheet, and wind had blown the dust or something. Or anyway, so I kind of imagined that there was sort of almost like rabbit ears of the bedsheet that were sort of exposed. In other words, a small little fragment of the bedsheet had been exposed out of the ground. Uh, I, I no way imagined that it was, and I also imagined that she was buried sort of right next to the well site, sort of um, very, very close to it. So when it turned out that she was buried somewhere, you know, very, not very far away, but, but quite far away. And also that the bed sheet was just completely in the open. I mean, it was some distance away between some bushes. And if you had run around the well site looking for it, you probably would have struggled to find it. I mean, the, the drone did solve that problem. And, and who would have anticipated that? I mean, I don't think Chris Watts in his wildest dreams would have anticipated a drone floating over the well site. I don't know whether he maybe thought Nicole Kessinger wouldn't reveal their relationship and thus um, he would be somewhat protected and insulated from the police. I just want to address something that Ashley Banfield says that's not correct and I realize you know um, when you got to look at it in context she was saying this around about in mid-October so before the discovery came out we've got the benefit of that hindsight so to criticize her when she didn't have that benefit is just unfair but nevertheless when you make a statement you've got to be careful making it in too direct a way otherwise it seems factual especially after the fact so someone listening to this now may have assumed that that was true at the time when it wasn't. In any event, where she says, um, before Chris Watts had even confessed, they had a drone at the site, and she was sort of figuring out how it was going on. Now, she was kind of putting pieces of the puzzle together. She was 
She knew that this was a company vehicle, which again would have made Anadarko uncomfortable with that whole line of interrogation. She would have known that company vehicles, especially the ones used by Anadarko, using the rover um, tracking system, would have given off GPS pings, so she would have known that. That also would have made Anadarko very uncomfortable, you know, like, haven't you been keeping track of your um, your employees? And, and maybe they had. Um, what what does the company know? Are the comp is the company um, really playing open cards? What else does the company know? And, I mean, wouldn't the next step in that inquisition be, well, the company also... Um, employs Nicole Kessinger or employs someone who is subcontracted, however you want to say it, but nevertheless, what can the company tell us about Nicole Kessinger? And, of course, that is ex precisely what Anadarko wouldn't want to, they wouldn't want to be in that position. They just wouldn't want that kind of attention. And that never happened. You never sort of heard Anadarko talking about Nicole Kessinger. Or the company that that w was doing the subcontracting either. You just never really heard anything. But in any event, what Ashley Banfield says here is that prior to Watts confessing, the company were already sending a drone over the site. That's not really true. It's sort of true because Watts didn't... Um, hadn't confessed certainly to what happened to the children, but let's let's just, instead of arguing the point, let's just remind ourselves what did happen. On the same day that Chris Watts was in the cubicle, and remember he was in there the whole day, he was in there from like 11 in the morning till late at night, and, and by the time he left he was under arrest and, and he never really saw the light of day again. But that particular day, they were at the well site. I'm talking about Luke Apple and the CBI, and they were on site and they were doing their reconnaissance, right? But they couldn't find anything. So, so they were where they were supposed to be, but they couldn't really find anything, and they kind of needed Watts' help to find something. And I'm not quite sure if they found the bed sheet before or after Chris Watts admitted anything, but he certainly did confess to killing Shanann um, fairly early on in the afternoon. He admitted that, remember. And then they knew about, so, so what they then thought was, well, she was killed in bed, and, and next thing, a bed sheet is found there. She was transported in the bed sheet. And, um, and then they wanted... Um, the rest of the information. And then, according to him, Shannon had killed the children, and so their bodies had been disposed at the well site. And he then marked on the photo, the aerial photo, where each child was. And they, even so, they weren't able to recover the bodies that Tuesday, even though he, he told them that fairly early, I think, on that day, I think it was around about 6 p.m. on Tuesday. So it was a long time later that they were actually able to recover bodies. Um, in terms of Shanann, it was several hours after that. Um, her body was actually exhumed um, very close to midnight, around about the time he was arrested and sent off to jail. But the children's bodies took quite a lot longer to... I just want to be explicit that it was more like at the same time that he was giving a partial confession, the drone was on site and, and not sure what it was looking for and not, not really finding anything either. They didn't really know what the significance, I guess, was of that bed sheet either. Um, I mean, it, that later on they would trace it to the same pattern as at the Watts home. But can you imagine if Watts had disposed of all of the pillowcases and so on and 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 kind of gotten rid of that it would have been quite hard to link Shanann and the the whole crime to the Watts home how would you then link it other than the fact that Watts worked 
at that well site and lived in the house. I'm just saying that would be a theoretical link, but how would you prove it? Well, the proof would be the GPS tracking, the Trinastich video. I'm just saying, um, uh, you know, I'm just taking us back to how prosecutors potentially would have worked with this. And you must bear in mind there's a difference between um, what you can demonstrate in court and the truth. I mean, there's one thing that what what is weird about the law is you um, can prove certain things and that's then the law, but the other things that are true but you can't prove, but the law doesn't recognize that, but, but it's nevertheless true. And a good example of that is the Oscar Pistorius case where he was found guilty of murdering an unarmed intruder, which is true, but that unarmed intruder was his girlfriend, Reva Stenkam, but the law doesn't recognize that. The law doesn't recognize that he knew he was murdering his girlfriend. But of course, if she screamed when he was shooting her, he would have known and he should have known. I'm just saying the law, the law doesn't recognize that. And in that sense, the law can be quite dumb. But it's also trying to protect people by saying, we've got to be absolutely sure Right, we've got to be absolutely sure, um, and that is why something like the Trinastich video wouldn't hold up in court. You wouldn't be able to say, you could say, well, it looks like maybe someone's running around here, but and that would create doubt at the at the maximum. But you wouldn't be able to prove anything with it. It wouldn't be substantive. It wouldn't hold up in court as as evidence. It would could be used by the defence to raise doubt, but nothing more than that. So the coverage on HLN just, you know, this aerial footage going over the well site and referring to Anadarka by name just wasn't a very good look for Anadarka. And one can imagine lights going off at, at sort of their corporate headquarters in Texas and people being very upset. Bear in mind, when a billion dollar merges on the cards, billions of dollars are at stake and someone is going someone stands to lose millions of dollars or billions of dollars and if you that person what are you going to do you're going to do nothing so we go now to point number 18 uh, the watts family home um, the, the um, address was confirmed i'm not going to provide it here but um, that allowed us to see where chris watts grew up and you know where his parents lived and they, and they still currently live there and kind of just gave us a sense of Chris Watts's journey just in a single image and later we would get the same sense from Shanann's parents and the contrast there to, to these homes was quite mar marked so for example if you looked at Shanann's parents homes and the Watts home and you looked at um, 2825 Saratoga Trail it was like two faces the one was a face of, um, one could say, modesty and um, almost like a Protestant work ethic and and um, just, you know, ordinary um, America in a way. And then this other picture was this very grand kind of over-the-top kind of excess that, that ultimately neither of those people could afford. Then number 19, again, this is going to feel a little bit out of sync, but we are going to come back to the central message of this episode, which is the the um, miasma around the autopsy reports. In any event, point number 19, it was found out at this point that uh, Shanann's ex-husband, Leonard King, filed for divorce from, from her. And that, this is from public records dating from April 2009. If memory serves, and I could be wrong on this, but if memory serves, Shanann and Chris Watts sort of went on their first date on August 10th, 2010. So around about a year after her divorce, um, they kind of went on their first date. But what's interesting is that her husband sued for divorce. Shanann didn't divorce her husband. Her husband wanted to leave her. And so one can... 
one can imagine this scenario repeating itself um, nine years later triggered Shannon in certain ways. In other words, you know, it is, even if you don't love someone necessarily anymore, or, or, or some of that feeling has dissipated, it's still quite stinging and painful when someone sort of hands you those papers and says, I don't want to be with you anymore. You know, the fairy tale's over for me. Um, it's, 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 you know, it's, um, it's, it's kind of devastating. And so when Chris Watts did the same thing, you know, he told her as well, it's the second man now that has said to her, I don't want to be married to you. Um, it's devastating. And how did Shanann respond? Well, she wanted to stay married. In Leonard King's case, I don't think she did. But with Chris Watts, there was a lot more at stake. There, were, there was a child on the way. There were two children already. And she wanted to keep her fairy tale going. And she tried. We're not going to deal much with family dynamics in this episode, but I, I am going to just touch on this aspect in the timeline. Um, we saw for the first time, and this is, again, bear in mind, this is in October, we're seeing the um, photos of Ronnie and Cindy Watson. There are very few photos of them, or there were very few at this, this point. And so now we were seeing them, and what you see is Cindy Watts holding, um, not sure who it is, um, but it, maybe it's Bella, and um, Ronnie holding uh, one of his grandchildren. And you must bear in mind, and I think this is something people forget, is they were loving grandparents, they loved their grandchildren. And... Chris Watts had to have known this. Chris Watts had to have known, you know, if he wanted to get rid of his family, well, what was his family going to think of that idea, right? So if his own parents love his children, um, how, how is he going to reconcile his this murderous scheme that he has with his own parents? Because he, if he cares about Nicole Kessinger, he also cares about... Um, his parents. It's not. It's not black and white that he, he just cares about his mistress. Although that is probably starting to trump everything in, in a in kind of a crazy, um, dumb criminal way. But the point that I'm trying to make is, Chris Watts had to be aware of the bond between his own parents and his own children, right? As you see in these pictures, and so. When Shanann, um, when Nutgate happened and Shanann said, you're never going to see my children again, she kind of opened the door to Chris Watts thinking, well, since you're never going to see your children again, if they disappear, well, you were resigned to that anyway. And it's not going to be my fault, it's going to be Shanann. Everyone's going to blame Shanann. Or, or certainly my parents are going to blame Shanann. She's, she's already said you're not going to see my children again. So them literally not seeing them again in Chris Watts's effed up um, way of thinking, you know, he, he did seem very, um, I don't know, I don't know if he was so in love that he couldn't think straight, but this maybe seemed like a brilliant um, circumstance that, that he could now pin onto Shanann. But what I am trying to say is if you take Nutgate away, could he have reconciled himself still to, to, to killing his children? You know, wouldn't his parents have blamed him? But now, now where Shanann has said, you know, you almost tried to kill my child. I, you, you're never going to see my children again. And also, um, you know, I don't, I don't want you to see them at all. And, and, I, and I don't want you to FaceTime with them either. I just want you to never see them ever again. Th that opened the door to Chris Watts making that happen so that his own parents didn't see them ever again. And of course, for him in his situation, that was a convenient, if cruel and heartless um, situation to, to manifest, to bring about. Do you see that? 
And when I say this, I'm not blaming Shanann or blaming anyone. I'm simply linking the dynamics together and showing Chris Watts' criminal mind, how he sneakily and craftily is using things that are going on to what he sees as, as, as his own benefit. Obviously, what is to his benefit is extremely um, destructive and damaging to, to three precious lives and Nico. And we'll get back to Nico in a moment. Uh, number 21, uh, this is the first time I think I had the proper floor plans to the first and second floor of the Watts home. I did have approximate plans of similar model homes, but, but they weren't the exact plans. And so um, it was very good having this um, at this point. Bear in mind that I'd already written two books. I was working on the third, and because of what is going on, it was important to address um, the elephants in the room, being Anna Darko and, and Lavelle. Um, and, and obviously a lot was happening in October while I was writing to Pollyannas. Number 22, HLN releases material from Shanann's heartbreaking blog. So you can go and look at that on the um, uh, on the if you scroll down the the blog post you can go and look at that little clip. Um, I am going to be covering it on Patreon that particular blog. I have covered it on Crime Rocket before, but the point to emphasize with that is when did Shanann uh, start? I'm talking about blip with Bella now. When did Shanann start? chronicling in detail um, the journey that she took with Bella, right? And the answer is around about 16 weeks. So this particular blog, um, and, and I'm going to go through it on Patreon, just shows how Shanann shows every time she buys toys, every time uh, uh, some item of clothing is bought, every doctor's visit, every visit to the ultrasound, all of it is chronicled. But all of this kind of starts from around about... Um, uh, 16 weeks, obviously um, announcing that she's pregnant, but then and then going through the the pregnancy. And Chris Watts obviously knew this. He'd been through this whole um, narration of the pregnancy journey, and he was terrified that she was going to do that with Nico. She was terrified. He was terrified that the same thing's going to happen. But he doesn't want this child. He doesn't want this baby in, in this case. And um, how is he going to explain to Nicole Kessinger that Shanann is just so happy and gushing and Chris Watts is the best father in the whole world when, when he needs to be getting a divorce and he needs to, you know, he wants to be, he wants her to have a, a child with him, as, as, you know, give him a son. So he couldn't have that. He knew Shanann's habits very well. Um, and this time it would be chronicled more than likely on Facebook under kind of a Thrive-themed pregnancy. It's something I've, I've spoken about before. And this was really making him terrified, and that's something he had to stop. So I don't think it's accidental that th this crime happened on about the 15-week mark. It was actually going to be around about 16 weeks when they were going to do the gender reveal. And that would be the exact same time that she always kind of went public with everything, right? When, when she knew the baby was viable and she could now let the whole world into her fairy tale. He knew that that, that was on the cards and that was, that was why he did what he did when he did it. I mean, that's also why Shanann was back going to be back home when she was back home was it was around about the 16 15 16 week mark and now I'm going to spend the next weeks chronicling the pregnancy that's going to be what I'm going to be doing for the next couple of months that's going to be the main focus and Chris Watts didn't want that he wanted the focus to be the opposite I don't want this child and I want a divorce and Shanann wasn't going to allow that Point number 23 is just some images. I'm not going to go through them here. 
point number 24, again, I just want to remind you of how the legal system works. Um, it's, again, just photos taken from the, the graveyard. You, you see only three graves. You see one for Celeste, one for Bella, and one for Shanann. And it's, it's quite sad looking at these images because, um, you know, time has passed. And, and um, I don't know, it's just sad. But the point is, Nico was actually buried with Shanann. And, and the reason is, Nico isn't recognized by the law as a separate person. He, he doesn't have rights as, a, as an individual. So he can't have a grave as an individual. I, I'm not sure if he even gets a death certificate. Because he, he didn't, he didn't um, you know, the moment a person is born into the world, they are recognized as a person. Um, but there's, there's, a, there's some sort of difficulty in saying at what point in utero is a person a person and at what point should they have certain rights and, and shouldn't they? And there's a lot of debate about that and there's a lot of differences in different parts of the world about that. Some people have more rights earlier on and some have more rights later on and some have no rights until they're born. We all know that, but I'm just saying it's the funny way that the law is. Obviously, if someone is pregnant and there's a person inside their stomach, there is something there. But the law also finds itself in a difficulty when the parent says, well, I'm alive and I have rights. And I think my rights are more important than, than the rights of this this person that hasn't quite formed in me. I'm just saying that's what the law sometimes sees. I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong. I'm just saying the law finds itself sometimes with a problem there. And some people might say, you know, shouldn't the rights of the, this unformed person trump the rights of the the person who conceived them. And th that's kind of a way that the law says um, and has been saying, because the law obviously has always given rights to people who exist, that is kind of the way that the law is skewed. And so if, if you want to bring new laws to say, no, well, let, let's give more rights to the unborn, um, the law is always going to sort of remember the, the historic fact that, that it's always given more rights to the um, people who are alive, if that makes sense. I, I don't really want to go into this area because I know it's going to be very emotional for people, but in a weird way, I think what Chris wanted was an abortion. And, I'd, and, and you know, the, I don't know if he was very clear saying to Shanann, I want an abortion. Um, if he was clear, he took very long to communicate that and um, in any event and I realize it's quite crass saying this but in, in any event the the murders was a was a way of um, having an abortion and that is where the law recognizes that and says that is murder that is unacceptable but it, it does sort of if you if you if you look at the situation you say how could society have changed not necessarily what's his personality or Shannon, but how could society have changed so that in the situation it would have been okay for whatever to happen and then what would have happened is this family would have lived maybe not necessarily happily ever after but but would have not been killed because one feels that Chris Watts committed this crime to make to, to appear right with society, even if that society, the way he saw it, was mostly Nicole Kessinger, but maybe also just society as a construct in his own mind, if that makes sense. It is something I've spoken about, but um, you know, if you think about a situation w with a pregnancy like this. If you've told social media that you're pregnant and then you then decide, wow, this it really isn't going to work out. I really can't have this child. Now, whether you agree with this or not, I'm saying 
if someone does this and they then have a change of heart, are they not going to have a child because of social media or because of what they said on social media? Or you can think of it in that way that if they hadn't communicated something on social media, they would have the freedom to make a choice that they have um, more freedom to make, if that makes sense. I'm, I'm not saying whether the choice is right or wrong. I'm simply saying that the social media kind of creates a path of no return, if that makes sense. And Chris Watts also was on a path of no return with, with what he did. And what I'm trying to say is, you know, is there a way that society can look at this and maybe mitigate those paths of no return so that people don't feel that they don't have a choice, that they can get divorced, that they can, um, you know, if it's an unwanted child, that they can resolve it in some way that, that's not so unpleasant. I mean, if it's done the right way. And this brings us to point number 25. Um, you know, I was really going to talk about this, um, but I don't think, because we're already at 35 minutes, I don't think I'm going to deal with it in this episode. I'll deal with it in the next episode. But it's basically um, Weld County District Court denying Weld County District Attorney Michael Rourke's request to keep the autopsies sealed and is saying it lacked subject matter jurisdiction so i don't think i'm going to take it further than than point number 25 i'm meant to go right through the end to november but um it's that the, the, what remains is quite a lot to get through so so i'm, I'm sorry about that change of heart. What I will do is just go through the blog post that I wrote um, on, I think, October 12th, October 14th. Um, so it's published on Crime Rocket on October 14th. You're welcome to go and visit it. But I'm going to just go through it quickly with you. And it is titled, will Weld, What Will Weld County Coroner Carl Besh Do About Those Autopsy Reports? And this is what I wrote at the time, October 14th, 2018. It, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Weld County District Court Judge Marcella Kopkow denied Weld County District Attorney Michael Rourke's motion to seal autopsy reports in the Christopher Watts triple murder case. In plain language, the Weld County District Court is arguing with the Weld County District Attorney. Irrespective, it's all up to the Weld County Coroner, Carl Blesch, to decide now what happens to those reports. If Blesch decides not to intervene, theoretically the reports could be released as is by as early as Monday, October 15th, just over two months after the murders. So bear in mind when, when there was initially that pushback about releasing the reports. They were kind of saying, well, they're not finished yet. Well, now it's not a matter of that they're not finished. Now it is a matter that the district attorney has sort of put his foot down and said, I'm not releasing them, but that's been overruled. But now it's the coroner who must decide what he's going to do. And bear in mind, at this point, everyone was waiting with bated breath on this particular issue. The media were circling like vultures. Um, I guess Ashley Banfield and HLN were also expecting it to come out any second. And of course, if it didn't come out, you would almost have the opposite effect. You would have this wave of anticipation building and then just dissipating into nothing. And that is kind of what happened. Everyone was expecting this and, and uh, interest was piling up and then nothing happened for about three weeks after this. So, so literally, um, there was like this hush where, where everyone was waiting and then nothing happened. In fact, the next thing that happened after this was basically Nicole Kissinger breaking her silence. I think it was on November the 5th. So, so that was the next sort of um, bombshell in this case. 
So that was three weeks after this, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, and what I said is it's unlikely, it's unlikely that um, Blesch would release the autopsy results. What I wrote is more likely Blesch will file a response to the request based on the processes pres prescribed by the Colorado Open Records Act. And then I quoted the Greeley Tribune, uh, which said, Blesch basically has two options, take legal action or release the reports. Uh, Robert said Cora allows a three workday period for response to a request. And then I wrote, if Blesch files a response to the course, this will almost certainly be either to refuse to release the report or to release a limited or redacted version. But we already know what Blesch pl plans to do, and this is quoting from the Tribune. In an email to the Tribune after Rourke's motion, Blesch said he agreed with the motion to seal the reports in an effort to ensure the integrity of the ongoing investigation and a fair trial for the defendant. And so what I said is, wow, Blesch is basically saying the autopsy reports are being withheld to protect Chris Watts, a family annihilator, someone um, widely seen as a despicable human being. Who, who on earth wants to protect him? Oh, the prosecutors. The prosecutors want to protect him. So I had a bit of scorn for this, which is why I said, really? And then I said, whatever is really going on here, the contents of those reports and findings as they relate to the Watts case are likely to be extremely shocking. And I don't really know what to say about that statement today. Um, if you say, so were the autopsy results so shocking that they needed to be either redacted or withheld? I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if the autopsy reports really were shocking and they have been sort of... Um, redacted or what we've seen is the initial autopsy report because what could have been shocking is for example the use of oxycodone the extended version or the, the full version of the autopsy reports um, could be very shocking of course um, photos and so on have never been released so in that sense it is redacted and that part is extremely shocking but I think the reality that was being acknowledged here in terms of the emotional reality, the sort of gut feel, was that something shocking was going on, but what was being withheld. And, of course, there was a lot of shocking stuff. There, were, there was the very sexual, very sexually active uh, affair that was going on, which was shocking under the... Um, you know, d during the, the pregnancy and all that kind of thing. Um, but besides all those things that were shocking and, and the way that the bodies were disposed, the other th shocking thing was the plea deal. I mean, arguably the plea deal is one of the most shocking and inexplicable aspects of the entire Watts case. It kind of just doesn't make sense. Why do you take a plea deal to avoid the death penalty when you would never have gotten the death penalty? And so that's another thing where, where you sort of have two faces. Do you know what I mean? Like the law is saying something, but it seems to be hiding something else. And so the autopsies kind of showed how, even in terms of the law narrative, you've got something hiding in plain sight. And in the next episode, I'm going to take you through how you sort of had these dates and everything and how um, all the motions and so on, of what the what is really going on and what is really going on was the plea deal the effort to to pursue a plea deal but also to keep it secret they, they wanted to keep the sec it secret for a few reasons one of them being if it became public you would get people like Chris Watts's family trying to convince him not to take the plea deal and I don't know about you but do you think it was wise for Chris Watts to take the plea deal would you have advised him to take the plea deal? From a from from a legal expediency perspective, um, the, the way this court case went couldn't have gone better. So that's a fact. Is Chris Watts happy with what happened? 
I'm not sure if he is. You know, it, it, it sounds like he is talking about wanting to get out of jail, he doesn't want to spend his whole life in jail. I, I don't I don't say that the um, sentence he got he doesn't deserve, not at all. What I but what I do say is I think we deserved a trial. And I th also think he deserved a trial. And I think the families, I think everyone deserved a trial. I think the only people who felt that they didn't deserve a trial were Anadaka and Lavelle. I think they felt they didn't deserve a trial, but I think they did deserve a trial as well. What do you guys think? So when Cole Blesch is withholding the autopsy reports to protect Chris Watts, is he really trying to trying to protect Chris Watts? Why would he care about Chris Watts, somebody who did that? Wouldn't he be wanting to protect someone else that wants to be protected? Not from Chris Watts's guilt, but from the, the, the poisonous glare of negative publicity. Who, who could be protected from that? Who, who could save millions by being protected in that way? Billions. Who? So we'll continue this narrative in the next episode in the series, What Else Do We Know? As I mentioned earlier, um, I'll be doing an analysis of that um, pregnancy blog of Shanann's um, covering Bella's pregnancy or, or pregnancy and birth of Bella uh, on Patreon. I've also covered the uh, Watts family dynamics as discussed in um, on Ashley Banfield. I've uh, uh, put that on Patreon. Um, it's been there's been quite a lively discussion around that. Um, it's upsetting to some people, and a lot of people are triggered by it. But you've got to try to not project yourself into that situation and not make it personal. This isn't about your family dynamics and what the Watts case says about you. It's about their family dynamics, and you can privately decide how that reflects on you or not. In terms of the ongoing Vincent van Gogh um, coverage, I, I know probably most of you aren't interested in that. I've got to say, I think I'm, I enjoy doing that and I, I enjoy that narrative far, far more than the Watts narrative. I think it's far more, there's far more of a human story. Um, it's probably equally tragic, but there's something um, very powerful about the van Gogh story. And what they share, what the Watts story and the Van Gogh story share, is how misunderstood men and women can be. And, and that's a reflection on us, not those people. It's a reflection on our inability to see reality. And the Van Gogh story is a safe way to do that, to go into someone's life story from 130 years ago and say, wow, I, I always thought this, and, and it looks like that was actually what was going on. And when we can start doing that about other people, we can start doing the same about ourselves. We can turn that same um, cool gaze at ourselves and say, wow, maybe I can do this differently. Maybe I can um, see society differently. And maybe I can also change society for the better, given that we're all making the same mistakes. And you know, if we can come out of that denial, we can certainly come out of a, a society um, leaving the world um, a better place or less less bad than, than it's, it's on its way to being. I mean, in the end, we want to be responsive human beings who live in this world. There's a scene in the movie Lord of the Rings where the hobbits are in this forest and one of the hobbit pals is in trouble. And they say to these huge trees, um, you know, can you help us? And the trees say, you know what? We've thought about it, and, and we're not going to get involved. And the hobbits sort of shout at the tree saying, but aren't you in this world? Aren't you a part of this world? And that is what eventually convinces them to act, is the fact that they realize they are part of this world. And we need to do the same. We need to realize we are part of the same fabric. No matter how different we are, we're all on the same mud ball called Earth, and um, ultimately... Whatever happens, we're all in it together. So, so why not have a good outcome? And part of having a good outcome is seeing what is happening before it happens and making sure 
um, the bad things don't happen and trying to make ourselves better. You know, and if enough, enough of us become better and better at seeing our world, then we will have a better world and our world will be better. And isn't that worth fighting for? So thank you for listening and I will speak to you guys next time. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.